welcome as we continue our focus on Israel. Why focus on Israel? So vitally important in understanding the Word of God. So neglected in churches and Bible schools to the detriment of the church in its understanding of the Bible and ultimately the blessings of God. I hope you go back and restudy, re-listen to these lessons. We still have a number to go. But these are vitally, vitally important in my estimation for understanding the Word of God. Why we must focus on Israel. We're just looking at an overview in all of these areas that we're looking at. Certainly a lot more detail could be said on any of these. The lesson that we are going to focus on now is God's promises to Israel are eternal. It would be lesson number seven in our course on why focus on Israel, or our class, I should say. God's promises to Israel are eternal. Now that is in contradistinction to uh, the vast majority of the church that says that's not true. But clearly, it is. It is recognized by all serious students of the Bible that the covenant of God with Abraham is one of the most important and determinative revelations of Scripture. It furnishes the key to the entire Old Testament and reaches for its fulfillment into the new. In the controversy between premillenarians and amillenarians, the interpretation of this covenant more or less settles the entire argument. The analysis of its provisions and the character of their fulfillment set the mold for the entire body of scriptural truth. The issue, we looked at this quote previously by Dr. John Wolver. The issue, in a word, is the question of whether Israel as a nation and as a race has a prophesied future. A literal interpretation of the Abrahamic covenant involves the permanent, the eternal existence of Israel as a nation and the fulfillment of his promise that the land should be there ever lasting possession. So again, we go back to that root, that foundation, the Abrahamic covenant, so vitally important in our understanding of the Word of God. And if we understand that correctly, we will understand that God's promises to Israel, the Jewish people, are everlasting, eternal David Larson, in his book, Jews, Gentiles, and the Church, excellent book, out of print, if you can get a copy, well worth having, said this, in any reasonable, historical, grammatical approach to God's promises about the land and to the author's intention, both the divine and the human author, must be in our purview. It would seem that Israel and her land are going to be unique in perpetuity forever. The one cannot be without the other. If Israel is eternal, if Jewish people as the God's promises are eternal, the land promise is eternal because there is an intrinsic tie-in between the Jewish people and the land of Israel, and God's promises to Israel and the Jewish people are eternal, everlasting. Malachi 3.6 says this, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The hatred, the animosity, the genocidal attacks throughout history by those like Haman and Herod 
and Hitler, and ultimately the Antichrist, will all fail. Because the promise of God is that the sons of Jacob, the Jewish people, will not, are not, cannot be consumed. They are eternal because of God and his promises. Jeremiah 31 has an interesting portion of scripture about Israel. In verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations. So here he's speaking to the Gentiles of the world, to the nations of the world, to the prime perpetrators of hate and genocide throughout history against the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations, and declare it in the isles afar off, and say, he that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. The nation should sit up and listen and proclaim that the God that scattered Israel will ultimately bring them back to the land, just as a shepherd oversees his flock. And God will keep the Jewish people. That's Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 10. Later on in this chapter, 35 through 37, we are told this. Verse 35, thus saith the Lord, which gives the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divides the sea when the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Jehovah God has established the universe and given us the ordinances of the sun and the moon and the stars. And we are told then, if those ordinances, the sun and the moon and the stars, depart from before me, before God, saith the Lord, then, and only at that time, then the seed of Israel, also shall cease from being a nation before me forever, in perpetuity, eternally. You want to destroy Israel, you want to destroy the Jewish people, you want to make certain that they no longer exist ever again as a nation. The people, God says you must destroy first the sun, the moon, the stars the entire universe. Impossible. He gives you another option. Verse 37. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. You can't destroy the universe, so... Here's another option. Measure the universe. It's constantly expanding, according to scientists. How do we get that measurement then? It's impossible. You've also got to measure the depths of the earth. No one has ever done that. If you can do those two things, then God would also cast off all the seed of Israel, the Jewish people, for all that they have done. You cannot destroy them. You cannot get rid of them. They have an everlasting, eternal promise from God that cannot be destroyed. And though replacement theology places them outside of God's plan, cast off, it is in contrast, contradicts the clear teaching of the Word of God. It cannot be done. It actually goes on in Jeremiah 33, and we have the same promise. And the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day and night in their season, destroy the sun and the moon. Then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, 
that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne, and with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured, so will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that minister unto me. You want to break God's promise to Israel, the Davidic covenant, that there'd be a nation and ultimately a king to reign over them uh, for eternity? What you must do is destroy the sun and the moon. And he goes on in verses 25 and 26 of Jeremiah 33 and repeats it again. Thus saith the Lord, if my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Destroy heaven and earth. Destroy the sun and the moon. And then I will cast away the Jewish people. But if you cannot do that, and you cannot do that, God says, I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. When God says something one time in Scripture, we should sit up and take notice. But when he says it three times within a very short period, chapter 31 through 33, and uses the same challenge, you want to destroy Jewish people in Israel destroy heaven and earth, night and day, the sun and the moon. And if you cannot do that, you cannot destroy them. We need to sit up and take notice. How tragic that the great majority, perhaps as, as large as 85% of Christendom, takes the opposite view of this. God has cast off the Jew. God is through with the Jew. God's replaced Israel with the new Israel, the church. What a tragic teaching. Unbiblical. God's promise to the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, is eternal, everlasting, in perpetuity. Ezekiel 36, 19 through 22 tells us this. And I, God, scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way, according to their doings. I judged them. And when they entered onto the heathen, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said to them, these are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. God scattered the Jewish people among the nations of the world. Why? Because they were sinful. They were rebellious. When they went into the nations of the world, they profaned the name of God, his holy name. But we are told in verses 21 and 22 of Ezekiel 36, God says, But I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen wherever they went. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen wherever you went. See, the promises of God to Israel are unconditional. It's the Abrahamic covenant. It is not dependent upon their obedience. They were actually very sinful, rebellious, idolatrous at times. And God says, what I'm going to do is not because you deserve it, Israel, for my holy name's sake. My reputation is at stake. You know, we have the same type of teaching for believers. In the book of Romans, an overview of the first eight chapters, very brief. We were condemned. We have been justified by grace through faith. We are being sanctified, and we will be glorified. Now, why should we think that promise, that one day as a believer I will be glorified, you will be glorified, is secure? Well, Romans 9 through 11 gives the answer. The same God who made an unconditional promise to Israel 
and will bring it to fruition because of his reputation for his holy name's sake. That same God will bring to pass what he has promised to believers that one day we will be glorified. Our lives should be changed. Our lives should be better once we're saved. But we're still sinners saved by grace. In no way do we merit glorification. It's God's promise. That's what he's saying here. It's for his holy name's sake. It's eternal, not because Israel deserves it, because God has made that promise. And if God were to break that promise, he would be a liar. Romans 11, 25 through 29. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, speaking primarily to Gentile believers lest you should be wise in your own conceits, lest you might embrace something like replacement theology. Tragically, the church has ignored this. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. The fullness of the Gentiles is a negative term, that they have refused the gospel, neglected the gospel in going to the Jewish people, and finally God said enough is enough, and he has set them aside taken them off the scene through the rapture. And then, so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. They shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant, God says, unto them, unto the Jewish people, when I shall take away their sins. That's the new covenant. As concerning the gospel, they're enemies for your sakes. Unsaved Jewish people. But as touching the election, God's promise to Israel, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God can't change his mind. God cannot turn his back on Israel and the Jewish people. It's an unconditional, eternal promise that he will bring to pass. Israel is eternal. Understand that. I don't care how many in the Christian world say God's through with Israel. God says, God forbid. It cannot, will not happen. Israel is eternal. Not because they deserve it, but God will bring to pass what he has promised for his holy name's sake. Israel is eternal. Until next time.